All right, I want to switch gears here real quick and look at an introduction to the screw tape letters, which we're going to be reading over the next couple weeks. So with a little bit of time we have, I want to give a little bit of background on who C.S. Lewis is, why he's important, and what is happening in the screw tape letters. So how many of you guys have read the screw tape letters before? Anybody here? Okay, pretty good. How many people have read anything by C.S. Lewis in here? Okay, quite a few. Maybe Chronicles of Narnia, is that one a lot of people have read? Mere Christianity, okay, good, good. So C.S. Lewis, I don't, I don't think it's a stretch to say that he's probably the most important Christian author of the 20th century, okay? And that's, there's a lot of people in the 20th century, and I think most people would say if he's not the most important, he's probably in the top, at least the top five, okay? So who is C.S. Lewis? I've put a couple things here. So he's born, you can see, in uh, 1898. He's born in Belfast, Ireland. And one of the most important things that happens to Lewis is when he's really young, I think he's like six years old, and his mother gets very sick. She has cancer. And, it's, and you think about what life would be back at the beginning of the 20th century, probably, that medical technology is very primitive at this time. And so his mom has cancer, she's very sick, there's doctors coming in and out, she's doing these treatments that are you know, kind of freaking him out as a kid. And he's raised nominally Christian, so I mean everybody's Christian back then, right, if you're in the UK. And so he's born, so, so he's somewhat Christian, and he talks about when he was very young and his mom is suffering, that he prayed over and over again for his mom to be healed. And she's not healed, and she dies. And he's really shaken by this, as you can imagine. And he spends the, the rest, or you know, the following years as an atheist. And as he gets educated and he grows and gets smarter, he's becoming more and more entrenched in this world of atheism. He serves in World War I, he actually sees battle, and he's injured, and he comes back to England, and he goes to school at Oxford. And he gets a degree at Oxford, and he ends up uh, teaching at Oxford. And I don't know if you know much about Oxford, but it's an amazing place. They, it was founded like in the 1100s, like 12th century, okay? Which to me is just mind-blowing. That's when universities were a new idea. Man, yeah, it was like one of the first. Like University of Paris was the very first, and then Oxford is the second one. And so you think about the Reformation when the Reformation happens, Oxford had already been around for like 400 years, okay? It's hard to wrap your mind around that. And so Lewis is there, and so Oxford is, you know, probably the most prestigious university in the world. And so, he's, so he gets uh, a, a job there, and he is a, what's called a tutor, because I don't know if you know much about sort of Oxford, Cambridge education, but if you were at Oxford, you wouldn't be in classes like this you would be in tutorials. And so rather than coming to a class every, you know, every other day, you would meet with a tutor. And then when you sit down with a tutor, he would give you some sort of assignment, you know, like why is Shakespeare better than you know, Mick Jagger or something like this, right? Something just kind of come up with some sort of argument that something is better than something or the history of something. And so he would send you away and you would spend a couple weeks just researching in the library, coming up with this paper, and you would meet with him again, and you would read your essay to him, and he would say, well, you know, in the second paragraph, you said such and such, but is that really true? What's your source for that? Where did you get this from? And so you would, pretty intense meetings, okay? And this is what Lewis is doing. He's not, he would give lectures every once in a while, but he was mostly just meeting with students one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two and sharing stuff with them, okay? And again, during this time, he is an atheist. And I think we talked before about how Lewis came to faith through, remember who J.R.R. Tolkien, the guy who writes Lord of the Rings, he's a Catholic. And the main thing that Lewis gets from Tolkien, I think we mentioned this before, is that Lewis didn't want to be a Christian because he thought Christianity was just another myth, like Thor, something like this. And I mean, nobody's going to worship Thor or that kind of stuff, or Hercules, because they're obviously not real. 
So for him, he thought Christianity was basically the same thing. It's like, I'm not going to be a Christian because I'm not going to be a part of these ancient myths. But Tolkien says, well, what if Christianity isn't just a myth? What if it is the true myth? What if it is the myth that everything else is based on? And Lewis comes to think this way, and he goes, actually, that makes a lot of sense, and he becomes a Christian. But the cool thing about what, what Lewis ends up doing is that he, as a Christian writer, he doesn't approach Christianity as like something he's describing. He actually invites people to kind of get into Christianity and walk around in it and feel it out and try to see things from a different perspective. Um, I put a quote here by, uh, let's see, Alan Jacobs, just the top part here. And here I would like to suggest something that is the keynote of this book. My belief is that Lewis's mind was above all characterized by a willingness to be enchanted. You might want to underline that, that phrase there. Willingness to be enchanted. Now most of us don't have a willingness to be enchanted because we're too rational and scientific and material, right? And so he had a willingness to be enchanted and that it was this openness to enchantment that held together the various strands of his life. So part of what he's saying here is that especially when Lewis is approaching his writing, he doesn't approach it just as describing something, but he wants you to get inside of it. And one of the most interesting things, ideas that Lewis gives us is he says that one day he was inside his workshop, okay, and then he realized that as he's standing inside his workshop, it was sunny outside, and there was a beam of light coming through like a, like a window or a wall in there. You guys ever seen this where there's a beam of light and there's like maybe dust flying around or something? And you can actually see that beam of light. And so he said, you know, he's looking at this beam of light and he's seeing dust particles and stuff. But then he does something a little bit kind of different. He gets down on an angle, kind of stoops down. And rather than looking at the beam, he looks, what he says, along the beam. And so rather than just seeing the beam there, he gets down, he looks at it. And as he looks through the beam, he kind of sees what's outside. He sees the trees, he sees the sky and everything that is kind of behind this beam of light. And so he says there's two ways that we can know things. We can know like that we can know this beam by looking at it or we can know it by looking along the beam. OK, so we can know in these two different ways. Like I can know about coffee, I can know about the chemical compound of coffee, how else can I know coffee? I, I could drink it, right? And those are two different ways of knowing things. And so Lewis, one of the things he wants to do is he wants to invite us into looking along the beam at Christianity. And one example of this, in The Voyage of the Drawn Treader, I don't know if you've read this, one of my favorite books ever, the best character in all of literature, Reap a Cheap, is in this book. <laughs> and I, like, he is, he, talk about masculinity study. I would not want to go up against this mouse because he would just demolish all of us together, okay? But there's a scene in The Voyage of Drawn Treader where Eustace, who is just the brattiest, most horrible person ever, and he's always complaining, he, you know, he's always hungry, he doesn't like anybody, and he's on this island and he finds his treasure and he gets this, this uh, like bracelet, he goes, oh cool, I'm gonna take this, and he's got all of this treasure that he's gonna have for himself. He falls asleep, and then what does he turn into when he wakes up? What does he turn into? He's a dragon, right? He's this huge dragon, this, uh, you know, it's bracelet, which kind of fit him okay when he was a, a little boy. All of a sudden, it's pinching him, and at first, he thinks it's kind of cool to be a dragon because, I mean, that's awesome. Because, you know, if you get bullied by someone, you just visit them as a dragon and breathe fire on them or something, and that's pretty cool. But then he realizes actually it's not a good thing because he can't go home as a dragon. He can't do the things he wants to as a dragon, so he wants a change. And so he spends his time trying to figure out how can I stop being a dragon and be a boy? And so he knows these scales. He's got to get those off somewhere. And so in this, in this story, all of a sudden, we see things from Eustace's perspective. And check this out. This is towards the bottom. He says, well, he peeled. So he's... Who's the he in this? It's, it's Aslan, okay? And so Aslan is telling Edmund the story that he, Aslan, who's a big lion with sharp claws, 
He peeled the beastly stuff right off, just as I thought I'd done it myself the other three times. And so he tries to get the scales off himself. He tries to become better. Okay, question. Has anybody here ever tried to be better on your own? Like, okay, I'm going to stop doing the stuff I don't want to be doing. I want to do the stuff I do want to do. How many times has it, wor has it worked for you? <laughs> it doesn't, right? Because we can't change ourselves. We try to, but we can't do it. And this is a lesson here. I thought I'd done it the other three times, only they hadn't hurt. And there it was, lying on the grass, only ever so much thicker and darker and more knobbly looking than the others had been. And there was I, as smooth and soft as a peeled switch, or in other words, like a, a stick with a bark ripped off of it, okay? Smaller than I had been. That's also an interesting phrase. Then he caught hold of me. I didn't like that much for I was very tender underneath now that I had no skin on and threw me into the water, a baptism metaphor here. It, it smarted like anything, it hurt like anything, but only for a moment. After that, it became perfectly delicious. And as soon as I started swimming and splashing, I found that all the pain had gone from my arm and then I saw why. I turned into a boy again. Okay, so what's happening here? There's like some really deep theological stuff about regeneration. But Lewis doesn't tell us that. He just puts us in a story. And we look along the beam and we experience this story. Okay, it's through our imagination. Which is what he does in, in uh, screw tape letters. So on page two, I just want to cover this really fast. Okay. So in the screw tape letters, this is another book of imagination. And what we have, the letters are from screw tape, who is a demon, he's a head demon, and he's writing letters to Wormwood, who is his nephew. And so this is a book about how we end up getting tempted, okay? And so we have screw tape, we have Wormwood, and then the patient. This is the person who's being tempted, okay? And patient seems like a really good word. The Latin, uh, very, uh, the Latin root of patient is suffer, okay? Suffer. Anybody ever suffered here? Anybody like on the day before Christmas and there's all the presents under the tree and what does your mom tell you? Just be patient. And what are you doing? You are suffering, right? Because you have to wait. And so suffering is because we have to wait for something. And so a patient is somebody who goes to the hospital. You go to the hospital because you're suffering, right? And so what we have in here is this idea of what, a, what temptation looks like, okay? And in the opening here, the very front part, he, he puts these, this quote from Luther, which seems like a really good quote to have. He says, the best way to drive out the devil, if he will, will not yield to text of scripture, is to jeer and flout him, for he cannot bear scorn. So in other words, if you want to deal with Satan, don't be afraid of him. You need to scorn him. Like in the, the third Harry Potter book, right? Remember when they stand in front of this, it's like big cupboard, and there's a, there's a bogart in there, right? Remember, what are bogarts? These are the things that you are most afraid of, okay? And so coming out of this, this thing, you open the door, and the thing that you're most afraid of, whatever it is, comes at you, okay? And what is the key to defeating a bogart? Do you remember? Laugh. You laugh at them, right? The spell is this, is do you say ridiculous, right? Or some form of that. And when you laugh at that thing that scares you the most, it loses its power over you. And so what Luther's saying, this is sort of what Lewis is doing. He's saying, but really, Satan is ridiculous because God is perfect logic. He's perfect everything. And what Satan is trying to do is trying to undo all that, which is totally ridiculous, Okay. So in this book, a couple things I just want to point out really fast is you see this, this part where it says readers are advised to remember that the devil is a liar. And so as you read screw tape letters, you have to remember that what screw tape is saying isn't the truth. In fact, he's kind of lying about a, a lot of stuff, but the truth is actually in there. So you have to read it carefully because it is saying truth, but a lot of times that truth is inverted. So you can't just read it at face value. You have to kind of be a careful reader of what's going on here. So, for example, just a couple things that 
we can even see in this very first part that will help us read the rest of it. So letter one, here's how screw tape starts. I note that you say about uh, guiding your patient's reading and taking care that he sees a good deal of his materialist friend. But are you, being, uh, are you not being a trifle naive? It sounds as if you suppose that argument was the way to keep him out of the enemy's clutches. That might have been so if he had lived a few centuries earlier. At that time, the humans still knew pretty well when a thing was proved and when it was not. And if it was proved, they really believed it. Okay, so in other words, what he's saying is like humans really have like three basic things that make us up. Um, like the will, the reason, and then emotions. Okay, that's how we all have these things and this is what sort of drives us. Okay, and here's what we want to think the way that we work. Okay, reason, will, and then emotion. So in other words, I know I should do my homework because if I do my homework, then I'm going to do really, I'll get good grades and, you know, that's why I'm at school anyway. So I'm going to, so if I do my homework for the next hour, then... I will, you know, have better grades, right? And then so what we think is we have a good reason, so we end up doing it, and then we're happy because we did our work, okay, even though we really didn't want to. Is that the way we work? No. In fact, we are the total, total opposite, right? We have emotions, and then we do something, and then what we do is we justify what we just did, okay? Like, I know I should do my homework, but man, I just want to watch a movie, I want to play video games, I want to do whatever. And so because that's what you want to do, that's what you do, and then you rationalize it, right? Like, yes, I didn't do my homework, but tomorrow I'm going to spend three hours doing homework, okay? Or, yes, I just ate a Big Mac and three milkshakes, but boy, for the rest of the week, man, I'm going to diet, I'm going to exercise. And so we rationalize it all the time, don't we? And so what what screw tape is saying here is that if you end up making him look at arguments, look at reason, he's going to end up kind of on this plane where his reason actually is engaged. We don't want that to happen. We want him totally running off of emotion because if he does that, you know, so you guys know this. When you run off emotion for a week and you just do whatever you feel like and then you rationalize it, how do you feel at the end of that week? Like, I wasted time. I'm like, I just had all these empty calories. Like, you don't feel very good, do you? But there are times when sometimes, like, I know it's the right thing to do. I don't feel like doing it, but I'm going to do it, okay? And how do you feel at the end of that? Like, I feel pretty good. This is, you know, when Jesus says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What, what's he saying? Like, where you invest something, what you do, what you work hard at, you're going to end up caring about that, okay? And so even in just this first paragraph, we haven't even got through the full paragraph. There's already some pretty deep truths going on here, aren't there? So how do we deal, so how do we read these? Okay, so I just want to throw this out before we take off. When you're reading the screw tape letters, put yourself in the place of the patient. Okay, look along the beam. Get into the story. You guys remember when King David cheated on, like, like he had a baby with Bathsheba, he ended up leading the, to the murder of the, the husband. You know, it's horrible stuff, right? How does God confront him? He sends Nathan the prophet into his life. Okay, so Nathan's here. Does Nathan say, hey, David, you did, you start reading these lists of stuff about how bad David is and, like, here's the horrible stuff you did. What does Nathan do? Yes. Yeah, he gives him a story, right? Like, this rich guy had a ton of stuff, and then there was this poor guy who had one lamb. The rich guy wanted to have a fee, so he took this one lamb. David's like, kill this guy. He's horrible, right? And what does Nathan say? He points his finger and says, you are the man, right? So in this story, you are the man slash woman, all right? So read it from that perspective, and it will change your life if you let it, okay? Are you guys ready to go? Ready for the weekend? Ready for the Super Bowl? 
All right. Turn in the white sheets on your way out and see you on Monday. Have a good one.